Welcome to Simpler Bible, a daily journey to biblical understanding. Day 28, and we have even more plagues, all right? So, of course, that felt like a very appropriate title. This is even more plagues. So far, Pharaoh has not been swayed by any of them, right? He's not having his mind changed. That shouldn't surprise us. We know that already. And so let's begin in chapter 9 of Exodus. We're going to cover two chapters again today, Exodus 9 and 10. And let's begin in Exodus 9, 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with severe plague on your livestock that are in the fields, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So there's that distinction again. Nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And the Lord set a time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. The next day the Lord did this thing, and all the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. I love these little side notes, not one. Uh, we'll see this eventually in the books of Kings and Chronicles. And this, the Assyrian army is outside the walls of Jerusalem getting ready to attack it. And the Bible says that God declares that no one will even launch an arrow there. So you have this army, 185,000 strong, and not even one of the soldiers is going to launch an arrow there. And that image is always just kind of like seared into my brain. And so not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. I mean, this isn't like you had a sick cow that was on the verge of death anyway. None of the livestock of Israel died and not even one. And I just, I love these little kind of, I don't know. I, I like the details. I like the details. I love it. If you haven't picked that up in these first four weeks already, I, you haven't been paying attention, right? I love the details. So verse seven, Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln, let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh, and it will become fine dust over the land of Egypt, become boils breaking out on, in sores on man and beast throughout the land of Egypt. So they took the soot from the kiln, stood before Pharaoh, Moses threw it in the air, and it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. Now we have the magicians again. They weren't mentioned in the last one. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils came up on the magicians and upon all the Egyptians, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so the magicians, remember we saw them the first several plagues, we didn't see them in the fifth one, and now here they are, and the magicians can't even endure now the presence of Moses. So all the powers, if you will, of the Egyptians are being uh, demolished one after the other. So verse 13 so th this is like, there's not even reprieve from the boils before we get this next one. Look at verse 13. Then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning, present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For this, I, this time I'll send my plagues on yourself and your servants and your people that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and all your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. And this is important. But for this purpose, I have raised you up to show my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. For this reason, I raised you up so that I might, that's a terrible arrow, that I might show my power and so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Now, I have a couple of things written here to the side for you. One of this, this is quoted for us in Romans 9. We'll get into that later. Don't let that rest in your head too much. But over here, we have 40 years and 396 years. You're wondering, what does this have to do with anything? So we see in verse 16 that God raised Pharaoh up for this purpose, to show, to demonstrate God's power, so that his name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Now, in Joshua chapter 2, we're going to meet... Uh, a woman named Rahab. So I'll put these notes here for you. And you meet Rahab. She's a prostitute. She's also going to be in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And we're going to meet Rahab in about 40 years, 40 years from this point right now. And two spies come into Rahab's house. They're about, they're looking at Jericho. They're going to destroy Jericho in just a little bit. The Israelites are, they're about to come into the promised land. Jericho will be the first city to fall. And Rahab says to them, look, we know that your God has given you this land. She goes, we have heard about what your God did to the Egyptians and to the kings across the river. So 40 years later, that's this 40 years here, 40 years later, Rahab is still talking. In fact, the people of Canaan are still talking about what God had done. But also, all right, so here's the timeline. 40 years later, they enter into the promised land. 
six years of conquest in the promised land, and then 350 years of the book of Judges. The book of Judges covers about 350 years for a grand total of 396 years. And that brings us to 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 5 through 9. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 4, 5 through 9, the Philistines are attacking the people of God. And the people of God are losing. It, it's God's plan for them to lose in this case. They've rejected him. They've served false gods. And, and so the people of God are losing. So they go get the Ark of the Covenant, which we haven't seen yet. It's not even made yet in our part of the story. They go get the Ark of the Covenant. They bring it into the warfare with the Philistines. And the Hebrews are so excited that the Ark of the Covenant has come into the camp. They raise this huge shout. And the whole earth trembles and the Philistines go, what was that? And somebody brings them a report and says the Ark of the Covenant has come into the Israelite camp. And the Philistines in 1 Samuel 4, 5 through 9, 396 years later go, oh my goodness, this is the God that destroyed the Egyptians with all those plagues. We're dead. 396 years later, nations are still talking about what God had done. So don't miss this. Why is Pharaoh's heart hardened? Why is it, how is God using that, right? So Pharaoh hardens his heart against God. God resolves to use Pharaoh's hard heart. And, and then God goes, fine, Pharaoh, I'm going to use you, man, to get glory for myself so that the whole earth will hear of my power. And we see an example 40 years later, an example 396 years later, the people are still talking about the gods of the Hebrews or the God of the Hebrews and what he had done. So I, I love that. Every time I get to this verse, verse 16 here, it always makes me think of these other two texts, Joshua 2 and 1 Samuel 4. And now hopefully it'll be seared in your brain as well. So uh, look at verse 18. We'll pick up back there. Behold, this time tomorrow I will cause a very heavy hail to fall, such as never been in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now therefore send Get your livestock and all that you have in the field to save shelter. Every man and beast that's in the field that is not brought in will die when the hail falls on them. Then whoever feared the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into the house. But those who did not pay attention to the words of the Lord left his slave and livestock in the field. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards heaven so that there may be hell in all the land of Egypt on man and beast and every plant on the field and every land in, in the land of Egypt. So Moses stretched out his staff towards heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hell and fire ran down to the earth and the Lord rained the hell upon the land of Egypt. And there was hell, hell and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hell. Very heavy hell such as never been seen in the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hell struck down everything that was in the field in all the land of Egypt, man and beast. And the hell struck down every plant on the field and broke every tree. Only in the land of Goshen where the people of Israel were was there no hell. So again, we see God's making this distinction, right? And so Pharaoh called Moses, pleads with him, says, all right, look, you can go. And he's going to make some excuses. But of course, again, he's not going to let them go. And so we see down here at the very end of chapter 9, when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hell and the thunder had ceased, he sinned again and hardened his heart, he and his servants, he and his servants, so that the heart of Pharaoh was hardened and he did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Now, chapter 10, we're at plague 8 now. Then the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine, and that you may tell in the hearing of your sons and your grandsons how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians, and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. All right, a couple of thoughts here. One, I've done these things so that you may tell your sons and your grandsons what I did, and the signs that I've done so that you may know that I am the Lord. There's that again. So he's done these things as a testimony, not just for the nations of what he's done, but that the Israelites would tell them to their kids and their grandkids so that that would continue to go, so that people would continue to understand and know who God is and what he had done. So Joshua uh, chapter 24, I believe, verse 31, and then Judges chapter 2, uh, verse I don't know, 8 through 10, I believe. I'll look it up and I'll have it for you in the blog. But in both of these places, it says that as long as Joshua lived, and as long as the people who had lived with Joshua, served with Joshua lived, the people knew and served God. But the moment that Joshua and that generation died out, the next generation neither knew God nor the things that he had done. I want you to hear this. It, it, it went from one generation, one generation of people knowing God, and then their kids and grandkids not knowing God. That's going to happen for us here in, in the space of, if you can believe this or not, about 50 years, 60 years. There's going to be a group of Israelites who do not know 
who God is or the power that he's done. What did God say to them here in 10.2? I've done these things so that you can teach them to your kids and your grandkids so that they can know that I'm the Lord. What do they fail to do? They fail to teach these things to their kids and their grandkids. We see in Psalm 78, 1 through 8, that there is a rebuke of the people of Israel. And it's, it's speaking of this time frame. And it says that their kids didn't even know what God had done. And so Psalm 78 appeals to the hearer of Psalm 78, teach these things to your kids, not like the people who came out of Egypt, not like the people who forsook God, not like the people who forgot God. And, and so very, very important. God is saying, teach these things to your kids. And they don't, and then the nation of Israel in, in, in 50, 60 years is going to be wayward once again. Uh, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, it's been probably one of my favorite verses since my early 20s, is Psalm 71, 18. And if I have a life verse, I suppose that maybe this is one of them. Psalm 71, 18 says, Even when I am old and gray, O God, do not forsake me until I teach your glory, teach your power to this generation and to all who are to come. And that's kind of like... Part of why I love to teach. I, I want people to know who God is. But why is God doing these signs? Not just so his name will be scattered in the earth, but also so that the Israelites will know who he is as God. And so uh, verse 3, Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to go, behold, that tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country. They will cover the face of the land. No one will be able to see the land. They will eat what is left to you after the hail. They will eat every tree of yours that grows in the field. They'll fill your houses. They'll fill the houses of your servants as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have ever seen from the day that came to the earth. earth. And then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. So, if you grew up in West Texas like I did, you grew up calling these, these uh, big bugs with wings that scream in the summer and spring, you know, like you grew up calling those locusts. Those are cicadas, completely different. What the Bible calls locusts, we in West Texas grew up calling grasshoppers. So if you're picturing the cicadas, the 17-year cicada or whatever, screaming in the trees, if you're picturing that, you're probably picturing the wrong thing. Uh, these are more like grasshoppers and stuff like that. So... I don't know why we called cicadas locust, uh, but anyway, if you're wanting to know, picture hordes of grasshoppers coming in over the land, all right? So we get down to verse 13. Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt. The Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day, all that night when it was morning. The east wind had brought the locust. The locust came up over all the land of Egypt, settled over the whole country of Egypt. Such a swar dense swarm of locusts had never been seen before or would be again. They covered the face of the whole land so that the land was darkened. They ate the plants of the, of the land, all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Not a green thing that remained, neither the tree nor the plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now, therefore, forgive my sin only this once and plead with the Lord your God to remove death from me. So he went out from Pharaoh, pleaded with the Lord. And the Lord turned into a very strong west wind, which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. I love this picture that a big wind blows and all of a sudden there's a, a plague of locusts everywhere. And then like, Pharaoh's like, forgive me, talk to your God. And then another wind blows and all the locusts are gone. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And then we get down to this ninth plague. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards heaven, verse 21, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So this is Exodus 10, 21, a darkness to be felt. Moses stretched out his hand towards the heavens, and there was pitch darkness in the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the people of Israel had light where they lived. And I just think, this is another one of those moments that, how does this make sense? And it's beautiful, and it's miraculous. We talked a couple, yesterday uh, about miracles, and that these things are miraculous, right? But darkness in the entire land of Egypt, except for in Goshen, like, except Goshen's not an outskirts of Egypt. It's contained within the nation of Egypt. And there's this peace in the nation of Egypt that is still illuminated by light. And of course, this makes me think of all sorts of things like uh, John chapter 3, where it talks about God being light and in him there is no darkness. In 1 John chapter 1, it talks about that. This makes me think about the people who walk in darkness. Uh, this makes me think of the prophecies of the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. So many images here that come to mind from the New Testament. And so anyway, in, in the land where the people of God dwell, there's light. And for the rest of Egypt, it's darkness for three days. And then we get down to these last couple of verses of, of chapter 10. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and would not let him go. 
Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Take care that you never see my face again. For the day that you see my face, you will die. And Moses said, as you say, I will never see your face again. But Moses has some parting words for Pharaoh before he leaves. And we will see that tomorrow. Have a great day. Thank you so much for journeying with us today at Simpler Bible through another section of scripture where we come to know and understand God a little bit better. Look, if you're brand new to Simpler Bible, we have all sorts of resources available for you. Go to our website, simplerbible.com, and there you can find these videos, you can find our podcast, you can find links to our social media, and you can even find a blog post with additional scriptures if you want to go into a little bit more study than we had time to cover in this podcast and video today. We hope that this tool will be exactly that for you, a tool. Not something that replaces your daily walk with God, but something that enhances your daily walk with God and helps you to know and enjoy Him more. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we'll see you again tomorrow.